Okay, students, uh, let's get let's get rolling with lecture. Uh, let me bring this microphone down a little bit. Uh, get your clickers ready. We're going to have some homework this weekend about pretty much every th topic that we talk about today, which you can see up there. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any information for you about the exam. The Scantrons are not graded yet. And uh, I'm still working on the uh, clicker data. And the, uh, the Scantrons, they're, they're hard to predict. Sometimes you get them back this, you know, like if I brought them over there right after class, sometimes I'd get them back later that afternoon. Sometimes it takes a couple days. So, and that's what we've got right now. I might get them back this afternoon, who knows. Uh, but as soon as I do that, uh, I'll post the scores inside uh, web courses, and you'll see it as a new row in your grades page. And, and so hopefully that'll, uh, you know, that'll, and, and you'll also see a row for the, for the clicking score. So you'll, so basically what you'll see is two new lines, one for the Scantron score, one for the clicking score, and then a third line for the total which is basically adding up the, the first two, all right? And hopefully by the time you get back to school on, on uh, Monday, uh, we'll have that data up. Now, I have some quick questions for you, and let me start the question. Uh, this is going to, this first one is going to be a... Uh, Uh, kind of a public opinion poll. And so either answer, you, you have a choice of one or, or the other answer. Do the one that you think is good and I'll grade both of them correctly. Okay, here's the first question. And it's kind of an IQ test or survey, I guess, of what you think is... Because you know those folks up in uh, North Carolina and stuff, they've been getting blazed up by that hurricane. So, and I'll mark both of these correct. So just, I just want to see what, you know, how you guys answer. Okay, 15 seconds to vote. F 15, 14, 13, 12, 11. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Okay, we have 74 answers. And 42% of you voted for uh, air traveling at 100 miles an hour. And 58% of you voted for a cubic mile of water at 20 miles per hour. So that's kind of interesting. Now, I'm not going to make any remarks other than that, but I now want you to uh, go ahead and hit your refresh key. We're going to do another short answer. And now I want you to type in a word uh, or a short phrase. And this one I'll grade. Uh, so type in a real answer. Don't type in IDK. Think, type in something that's good. And then hit the send key when you're done. And, we'll, and we're gonna and I think probably we'll look at this one. Listen to all those clicks. Very nice. This is good. You know what I want you to do? Uh, I'm going to modify this for the second class. Uh, before you type in your word, go back at, uh, to the very beginning and type in A 
and then a comma, and then your answer, and then I'll know. Um, so if you typed in bigger, go back and type in A comma bigger, or B comma bigger. And that way I'll know which, which one you're talking about. And you could change your... Uh, you don't have to type in the word air or water. You can if you like. Okay. Good. And don't for, don't forget to hit the uh, send key. Yeah, and I'm going to be generous about grading this, but don't just type in a bunch of gobbledygook. Try to try to give me an, an idea. You know how many people want to know what you think? I do. Uh huh. Don't just type in the word A. Type in which one you chose, A or B. I don't see anybody typing in B. Cause I, and and mo oh, here are some people with Bs. Okay. If you answered B, type that as your first letter. Whoa. All right, I take that back. You guys are typing in Bs. Okay. It's just that I can't really see them because of the way this software works. That's not a bad answer. Ooh, no, that can't be right. I'm trying to grade these as we go, but. All right, uh, 30 seconds to finish your answer. Try to get it in there. Has anybody ever been to a beach that's that nice? Man, that's a nice one. Those little beach houses, although if there's ever a hurricane there, those things are toast. I had a friend though in Texas, she, she said uh, one time, Texas is the worst. I mean, because they have hurricanes, right? But if you if you if you go to all the different plagues and disasters in the Bible and stuff, they happen in Texas pretty much every year. So Texas is the worst. You know, locusts and floods and storms. All right, um, ten seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two. One, zero. Okay, that's pretty good. All right, I'm going to switch this over. You guys can look at this. And we can grade it. And remember, um, uh, this person, somebody typed A more solid, and then they changed their mind. Uh, A wind, including H2OL. Um, I guess... I'll give that a good grade. I like this one here, B most sense. That's that's actually, you don't have to signify if it's your answer, but uh, B, water's more solid. That is definitely true. Uh, water's not very compressible. 
I mean, they can, could, here's somebody just typed in B. Um, speed is power. Uh, well, we're going to talk about that. 120 is faster. Well, speed is part of it, but let's see if I can get this up here. Air more destructive. That's not an explanation. That's just restating what you think is the A force. Fast wind speed. A equals scary. Uh, powerful. Big pressure. Actually, that is incorrect because I think the water exerts more pressure, uh, but st stronger. I mean, these are these are reasonable uh, explanations. Speed, pressure, more destructive. That's kind of a restatement. See, when you're given an answer, more speed, you don't want to just say, you know, uh, use circular reasoning and just restate your answer. Bigger K and O. Um, I don't know what that is. Bigger and faster. There's something, you know, everybody's thinking, you know, a lot of these things, big 100 miles per hour fact. Uh, air can move H, that's true. Air can move H2O. Matter of fact, you know, a storm surge is air pressure moving water into a pile. And the way a storm surge works, they, uh, the, the center of the storm, the eye of the hurricane, is low pressure, right? And so there's not much atmosphere, relatively less atmosphere pr press down force per square inch in the eye of the hurricane, but around it, the water's getting pressed down a little bit more. Now, it's not a whole lot more, but it's enough for the stuff around the center to push stuff down, and the stuff that gets pushed down is going to bloop up into the center. It's kind of like a jelly donut. You know, if you squeeze a jelly donut, you know, they, you, know you go to Dunkin' Donuts, and they, they drill a hole into it, and they fill it with jelly in the middle, or like, uh, what's that kind, uh, Boston cream? You know, they, they, they drill it full of Boston cream. And, but if you squeeze it accidentally or on purpose, the, the, the filling comes blooping out. And that's, that's like the storm surge. It kind of bloops. Um, and it's enough that it can be several feet above sea level. And that's what kills a lot of people is the storm surge. Slow is bad. I'll be generous, stronger. Water is denser, nice. Uh, flood, come on, let's go up here. Uh, water, stronger. Water, worse. Uh, big is more dense. Bigger, more den. I guess I'll take that one. Breaks down all, or breaks down Al, whoever Al is. Dangerous. Deadly and longer. You know, the reason I'm asking about this is because, um, I don't know if you guys saw it, but there was, uh, all over the internet, there was this new video. I don't know if it's new, but I, I saw it for the first time. F equals MA. Nice. Good answer. It's always true. Uh, I saw this video, and it was a tsunami coming ashore in Japan. And it was, it was a video taken by some guy up on top of a building. You know, they, uh, they had a tsunami there a few years ago, and uh, it was really destructive. And so everybody evacuated to the top of this, the roof of this one building where they were at work. And they, this guy videotaped the tsunami coming in. And at first, it was just, you know, like a flood. And, you know, it's, you know, like, you know, water being poured out of somebody's, tr 
you know, like out of a, you know, a, a, a water truck or something, you know, you get a few inches running down, down the street, but it dissipates. But this just kept getting bigger and bigger. And eventually it was about 15 feet high, 50 feet deep. And it was really moving. And trucks, cars, forget about it. If they weren't bolted down, uh, B is more dense. That's righteous. If it wasn't bolted down, they were toast. Water fills objects. Uh, so does air, flooding, power. Power is, is actually a, a, an interesting answer because it has a very specific meaning, as we shall see in chapter 4. Flood damage. Flying objects. Uh, force varies. Yeah, that's, that's a good way to put it. More energy, B. Um, more water. Volume. Actually, the volume is, the water volume is less. And this is the key right here. Water's heavier. Boy, you guys typed in a lot of answers. Water is stronger. Yeah, water's not compressible. But anyways, it was amazing watching this video. Okay, that's squared away. It was amazing watching this video. Uh, th their building stood up. You know, it, it didn't topple. But everything that wasn't bolted down. Like there, there was telephone poles that were, stood up perfectly fine. Because they didn't absorb a lot of, uh, they don't have a lot of surface area. So they're not taking a, a total pounding. And they're anchored pretty good. And those buildings over Jap in Japan, they're built to withstand earthquakes. So I guess they're, uh, most of them are built to withstand tsunamis. And, uh, and uh, it, was, it was just impressive to see, you know, the power of the water. I mean, it t took big trucks. And it, the trucks were floating in the water. And they're washing down the street. It's just incredible. But the, the, the answer to this, the correct answer to this question, you know, why is water, water's more destructive. The water, moving water is more destructive. And, and you know, I gave everybody a, a, a free answer on that. But the, the short answer is that water's more destructive, even if it's not going anywhere very fast. You know, 20 miles an hour is plenty. And that's because of something that we call the quantity of motion. At least Sir Isaac Newton uh, discussed this in the very first pages of his famous book, The Principles of uh, the Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, although he, he wrote it in Latin. Um, he talked about the quantity of motion. And last Thursday, we I remember I showed you this postage stamp. And in this, we were talking about this this concept of impulse, F delta T. And I said that, you know, this is the thing that Sir Isaac Newton was, was thinking about, this quantity MV. That's the quantity of motion. And implicitly, that is actually the thing that is destructive for, for water because the mass of air is pretty small. Now, air will bust things up and it'll cause things to explode and stuff like that. But water by far, you know, is, is much more dangerous simply because it has more mass. Now here's a question, and we, we didn't really do this question. Uh, we're not gonna do it on clickers right now, so. Uh, but it, here's, here's what you wanna remember. The second law, F equals MA, another way to write it is F equals M times delta V over delta T. All right, that's F equals MA. So then what, if you cross multiply it, you get this quantity F delta T over on the left. All right. So what's left over on the right hand side? Well, that's this stuff, uh, M delta V. Okay. And so this equation, the impulse equation, is the one that we're going to talk about now because it encodes on the right hand side what Sir Isaac Newton called the quantity of motion. And in fact, the change in the quantity of motion, okay? And so this is, as I mentioned, um, let me go back. Do this again. 
I want to emphasize. Okay. Uh, th that was the first couple paragraphs of chapter 4.1. And so to, to reemphasize, Sir Isaac Newton's vocabulary was quantity of motion. In other words, the, the, the destructive force of water is encoded to Sir Isaac Newton as the quantity of motion of the water. In other words, it's got a lot of mass and a lot of speed. Air's got a lot of speed, but not much mass. Now, today we call that momentum. And this is the equation for momentum. The customary symbol is P, usually lowercase p. And it's a vector. It has a direction, so put a little air over the top of it. The direction of the momentum vector is the same direction as the velocity vector. So that's the other little arrow there. But it's multiplied by the mass. Now, if you've ever seen, um, watched like a, uh, a football game uh, or uh, you know, sometimes, sometimes uh, now you can't basketball, but you, you watch a football game. Sometimes you see a little guy, you know, a defensive back in the in the in the defensive backfield take down a big running back. You know, sometimes those. Those big running backs, they get loose and they rumble down the field. And, but, and the, the little guy can tackle them if he's got enough speed, if he's moved. And the little guys usually can move a little faster than those big guys most of the time. So whoever wins is the one with the most MV. So a little guy with a smaller mass can blaze up a bigger guy uh, if he's got more speed and the right direction. All right, so that's the terminology that Sir Isaac Newton used in his, in his uh, book from 500, almost 500 years ago, 450 years ago. And uh, we use the word momentum now. And actually, here's a comment from Professor Einstein. Um, he constructed, in his theory of relativity, uh, the four-dimensional version of momentum. And remember, his whole theory was that, that the universe is not just three spatial dimensions, but four-dimensional, a four-dimensional space-time in which time is the fourth dimension. And that applies to dynamical quantities as well. And so what he did was um, created this idea of a four-dimensional uh, version of momentum. Here's, here's a way to express it. Uh, it's, a, it's a vector with four slots. And the first slot is actually the energy of the object. And then the next three slots are the, the spatial momentum, MVX, MVY, and MVZ. And so, and we'll be talking about that, you know, probably next week. And we're not gonna go deep into the theory of relativity, but we will talk about this four dimensional structure. And it's kind of interesting because um, you may have, you know, heard, uh, in the headlines, uh, this, this big atom smasher they have over in, uh, in Geneva, Switzerland, uh, where they're trying to find something called the Higgs boson. And they ha supposedly they have found it. And uh, that's through a process called symmetry breaking. And so you sometimes hear, you know, see it in the newspapers and you never can find the, um, the definition of what, what symmetry is being broken. I'll tell you a little bit about symmetry breaking. Theory of relativity, yeah. Uh, that's also encoded naturally and elegantly, very efficiently, uh, using four-dimensional momentum uh, like this. Now, don't worry about, uh, you know, calculating, you know, uh, the curvature of space-time. It's tough. It's tough for the guys like me that are trained in it. Uh, so you won't be having to do it. But uh, concept-wise, yeah. Now, this week's homework you're going to have some uh, diagrams. I'm going to give you a bunch of uh, problems uh, concerning the skateboard interactions. Now, who do we have down here? Do we have somebody? Uh, Angelica. Angelica. And who was the other? Logan. Logan. Logan and Angelica. And remember, they were pushing off each other. I have some homework problems uh, that I'll set up for you by lunchtime tomorrow 
uh, about you know, this interaction. And you'll be calculating momentum. So we're now going to be dipping into a little bit more of Chapter 4, Section 1. Um, and so it's about these two imaginary skateboarders. They don't have any hair. They're stick figures, but they got the skateboard action going there. Okay. You observe two skateboarders interact, et cetera, et cetera. Raymond and Gregory. Raymond with an R for red. Uh, Gregory for a G for green. So you can identify these two chaps. Okay. And, um, you know, different positions different masses, interaction time, 0.52, et cetera, et cetera. So the question is, how much momentum does Gregory capture from the interaction? And you'll see that in the problem itself when you get to it. So just so you know, we're going to have some homework um, about this concept of momentum, MV. And you'll use the, the impulse formula for that because, um, you know, delta P, the change in the momentum from a force acting over time, uh, is, uh, is what that's going to be about. So let's talk about this dynamical quantity, the impulse. F delta T, it comes out of Newton's second law, fairly naturally, I would say. Uh, sometimes you see it written in shorthand, F times T. I normally do not do that, but sometimes you see that here and there. Um, you won't see it in, in our textbook. Here's the um, vector version of it. F delta T... Vector over the F, vector sine over the F uh, equals delta P, and P is a vector. This is the momentum vector again. So delta MV is the same as delta P. And here's something that you, you might want to take a note of, and I'll just verbally go through this with you. Uh, this is the most general form of it. In hidden figures, this is, the, this is actually what they're working with. They're working with uh, impulse, and they're trying to figure out distances and times and stuff for different forces, changing forces. And the thing that's difficult for those guys at Mission Control trying to figure out all this stuff is the mass is changing. So saying delta P, you have to account for changing mass because the rocket, once that, that rocket fuel, which is really heavy, uh, whether it's a solid or a liquid fuel, once it blasts out the, the rocket engine nozzle, it's gone. So the, it's no longer part of the, the, the system that's ascending upward. It gives thrust, but then, the, then it's gone. So the mass is changing. The velocity is changing. Delta P is tough to calculate. Uh, so we're not going to be doing any, any rocket science. With, but those guys at Mission Control, yeah, that's what they're doing. Okay. Uh, so the change of momentum is, is equal to the impulse. And uh, just to reinforce, it's another version of F equals MA, basically. So, um, and, and it's, it's recasting Newton's second law, F equals MA, into a way uh, that is, you know, delta T. That's like, um, you know, we talked about stopping time for a car in a snowdrift versus stopping time for a car going into a telephone pole. You know, that delta T stopping time is pretty important. It's, a, it's an important factor. And this, this way you can handle the delta T, all right? And for that reason, it gives us an easy way of calculating the stopping time um, of something that's coming to a stop, all right? Now, in your homework, you're going to, and, and actually, we're going to calculate this together now with clickers in just a second. Um, here's a question. Okay. Uh, and this is going to be a homework problem, for something like this. You'll have a homework problem, something like this over the weekend. Given a coin of mass 0 0.05 kilograms, in other words, 50 grams, sliding across the tabletop from left to right. At initial point X1, its speed is 1.7 meters per second rightward. And it then experiences a frictional force, F equals 0 0.020 newtons leftward. It slows down to a stop at position X2. What is the stopping time? So here's, and so you can jot this down. Uh, give it a coin of mass, 0 0.05 kilograms, et cetera, et cetera. So there's your given information. And from that, you can figure out the stopping time delta T. Because... Um, it slows down to a stop 
um, you, you know, that means that the final momentum counter is zero. All right, so that's the easy one. So when you're doing this calculation, and we'll do that together in just a second, um, it's fairly easy, at least one of them, if it's coming to stop. But the initial momentum, you've got to calculate that one. So that's just m times v. And we have enough to do that. I mean, look at that. We got the mass, m. We got the v, vi, v subscript i, 1.7. So we're squared away. So we can get a delta p, you know, final minus initial. We have the force. So over on the f delta t side, on the left side of the impulse equation, yeah, we got some newtons of force. And we're going to put a minus sign for that. Um, and left word, so we'll use a negative 0 0.020 newtons in our equation when we get to it, uh, which we're about to, uh, and, and then all the minus signs. And if you do your minus signs correctly and carefully uh, in this, um, you'll come up with a positive number for the stopping time. In other words, the elapsed time is going to be, you know, like 0.264 seconds and not negative 0.264 seconds. All right, so that's what we want to do. All right, so, uh, so there's our, our layout, P1 and P2. P2 is the cinchy one, that's zero. P1, we can figure out, just multiply. Uh, we have the force, and we'll use the negative sign. Let's do it. Okay, so P1 is uh, mv, rightward. And notice that I have a, a vector symbol over P1. And I, I don't really have any directionality other than the word rightward after the comma. That's sufficient. And when you're doing this, if, if you're writing something with a vector symbol over the P, uh, you want to put some indication verbally or, you know, using trig or something uh, of the direction. Now, we're not doing any fancy trig in here, so we'll just use verbal, you know, rightward or upward or northwest or something like that. All right, so you multiply those two out together. Anybody verify me? 0 0.085 kilogram meters per second. Calculate it out. <coughs> Raise your hand if you verify. You got it? Anybody else verify? Okay, good. Over there on the, okay, good. All right, so there's, now P2, piece of cake. This is what we call a walk in the park because it's just stopped. So just go ahead and write in zero. And it's momentum, the unit of momentum, we don't have a fancy name for it. You know, like the unit of force is the Newton. Okay, we don't have that for the momentum. So it's just kilogram meters per second, mass times the speed. Okay, and so here's my two momenta. And I've got them expressed carefully uh, as vectors. And I have plus signs in there to de denote rightward. And the one that stopped, it doesn't have a direction, so I don't really have to put anything in there. Now, let's go ahead and, and put the, this together. Delta P. Okay, final minus initial. P2 minus P1. You know, later minus earlier always, for deltas. So it's 0 minus 0 0.085 kilogram meters per second. And so delta P as a vector, now here's the minus sign in there. Okay, that's where the minus sign comes in. And what that tells you is you've lost rightward momentum. Your, your change, you know, if you're looking at your bank account and you know, you have a, a negative change in your bank account balance. That means you spent some money, all right? And uh, so uh, that's the same thing here. We've lost some rightward momentum, and that's encoded here. So delta P is leftward, all right? That's this, all right? Negative 0 0.085 kilogram meters per second. All right, let's put it into the impulse formula now. There's the impulse formula, and... Right down here is that negative 0 0.020 newtons of friction force. Now, we don't have to do anything fancy with that, um, although I think I might change that 
uh, into kilogram meter per second squared so I could cancel. Uh, but let's do, let's look at a couple things here. You could actually cancel the negative sign here if you want, left and right. You know, you can, you know, bundle those there out of here if you want. Now, I'm going to keep mine in there for a while and show you another place where you can, um, you know, if you don't think of it there, you know, you can think of it later. So here's, your, here's the uh, impulse equation. We plugged in the, fract the frictional force to the left as negative 0 0.020 newtons. And we calculated delta P, and that's a negative 0 0.085 kilogram meter per second. All right, so, um, so we're plugging in stuff that we either know or calculated. All right, and now we want to clear the left side, uh, so divide by uh, negative 0 0.020 newtons, and then you compute. Now here, um, now notice my denominator here now, instead of newtons, I've got kilogram meter per second squared. All right. Now, per second squared in the denominator is like sec regular second squared in the numerator. And that's going to cancel with this per second in the numerator, at least one of them. And so you're going to be left with seconds. So go ahead and make a note of that kilogram. And, you know, also the negative signs, you can cancel them here. So kilograms cancel top and bottom. Meters cancel top and bottom. You know, we changed the denominator from newtons into kilogram meters per second squared, so we could cancel. All right, so kilograms cancel, meters cancel. And then per second cancels, but you still have a per second in the denominator, so that becomes a regular second in the numerator, and then you got to compute. Uh, anybody have a computation on this? Uh, what do you got? Uh, what do you have here in the front row? Ding. Okay, 4.25. And so if I ask you to round off to the nearest tenth of a second, you know, so you'd, you'd go, you know, 4.3. All right, so let's try. You ready? We're going to do uh, some impulse calculations. Uh, so hit your refresh key. And uh, the first one is a multiple choice. And this one is just calculating an impulse, all right? It's multiple choice. The Klingon bird of prey. All right, so this is just calculating impulse, F delta T. And go ahead and vote. And, hey, you guys, there's more information in there than you need. There's more numbers in there than you actually need for the calculation. Do not let me trip you up. Read carefully, as always. It's good to see you guys consulting and debating about it. It's good. All right. You're doing good, but not everybody's answered. Uh, 30 seconds.
20 seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay. Um, you know we got a we got a little problem here, Houston. Uh, because the answer here is is just uh, this one. Uh, Twenty four. 12 newtons times 2 seconds, that's it, 24. Uh, and it's kilogram meter per second because it's, it's, it's an increment of momentum. And what happens after it absorbs that momentum, it changes its direction or maybe changes its speed or direction. Um, but for sure it's 24 uh, kilogram meters per second. Now a bunch of you voted for B, C, and D and one person voted for E. Um, I don't know how you get E. A matter of fact, I don't, oh, that'd be 12 times four. So if you multiply everything together, the momentum, D is actually a stab in the right direction because that is the initial momentum of the green blob of jello. But as far as the effect of the tractor beam, uh, it's 24 kilogram meters per second. Uh, now let me see this, 12 divided by 10.6, I don't know how I got 10.67. All right, let's do another one. Um, this one, you're doing a full calculation uh, of stopping time. So this is, you know, kind of like the, uh, this is kind of like a coin stopping time, except it's a basketball and different mass, different initial speed, different stopping force. But if you do everything the same as we did with the coin, you'll be good. So take a minute to do that. You guys are doing good. Yeah, and don't forget, you wanna, if, if you want to consult with your neighbor, it's good to do it now in class. If you have somebody that's sitting next to you. What kind of Mac is that? That's black, it's, is it? Is it? Okay. Because they just did a, a software update for stuff with it, it has dark mode in it and I, I haven't tried it out yet i thought oh maybe they're doing dark mode computers now does that affect the heat the f how much the fan goes on with the cover like that see a lot of people with you know different stuff okay uh, 15 seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Uh, good. Yeah, most of you got this one right. 
Uh, the correct answer is 1.6, but some of you didn't. Let's review it. Everybody. Okay, first thing you got to do is the momentum 0 0.800 times 22. Uh, so the initial momentum is 17.6 kilogram meters per second. The final momentum is uh, zero. All right, so, so here's your base. And, and kind of here, I've pre-canceled the minus signs. You know, I didn't make a distinction about uh, left and right here. Uh, I could have. Uh, but this is a basic um, uh, calculation here, 11 newtons of stopping force, delta T. So uh, divide both sides by 11 newtons. 17.6 uh, kilogram meters per second uh, divided by 11 newtons and you do the quotient and that works out to um, 1.6 seconds. By the way, um, go ahead and make a note. It, it's not in the, in, the, um, in the notes for lecture, but you can write this down. One newton second is equal to kilogram meter per second. Newton times a second, so that's like an F times a delta T, is kilogram meter per second. So unit-wise, that's what it works out to. A newton second is the same as a kilogram meter per second in terms of basic units. All right, so that's that little calculation. Now we're going to keep going. Uh, so that's a, a little bit more of chapter four, and we're going to dip backwards into chapter three and talk about uniform circular motion. Question? Um, I got concerned why is it negative? Because I, I didn't write in the negatives. I kind of, pre like I was saying, I pre-canceled them. But if you did that, they're going to cancel, and you're going to still come up with positive 1.6. So. I didn't make any uh, directional notation in it. And same as the Klingon question, you know, with the jello in space. I just said, you know, how many, you know, Newton seconds of impulse are you going to acquire? You know, I didn't ask about the direction. Same thing here. So, but, you know, if you, if you do say, all right, my, my friction, my stopping force is leftward 11, then you would put a minus sign. And, but then you have to do your delta P carefully, 0 minus 17.6, and then the minus sign's there. And it's going to be in this last quotient here, so minus over minus, bing, they get out of there. So, all right. Now, let's uh, talk about uh, chapter 3.6, uniform circular motion. And uh, we're going to talk about this uh, place called Nardo, the Nardo Ring. It's a test facility in Italy, uh, circular test track. Uh, they don't, I don't think they have anything like it in the U.S., but they've got it down there in the boot heel of Italy. Here's the, here it is on the map. I'm just going to kind of take a zoom in on it. Uh, so the boot heel of Italy, um, uh, here's the, the view from the sky. Here it is over here. You can see it. Let's kind of zoom in our, our cameras. Here it is. This is just Google Maps. So the radius of this circle is about 2,000 meters, two, you know, two kilometers, depending on which lane that you take. Here's a little closer view. And you can see that they got stuff inside the ring. Looks like they have farm fields in there. And uh, then they got the study. You know, they got all these roads inside there for the you know, the HQ and stuff, I guess. Looks like they have a landing strip as well. Um, so here's the, here's the direct overhead view. So that's a pretty careful circle that they've got. So let's talk about the Nardo ring. And it's a, it's a banked track. So if you go out to Daytona or one of the other um, tracks, uh, race tracks, they'll be banked. Some of them are really steep. Now the outermost lane at Nardo is configured uh, for 149 miles per hour optimal speed. Now, you may think, well, why are they testing uh, cars at, at 149 miles per hour? Because it's Europe. 
they have auto bonds over there. And in Europe, when you're on the auto bond, a lot of the auto bonds, I don't know if it's still true, but there was no speed limit. You just drive as fast as you want and as fast as you think is good. Kind of like Montana. You know, Montana used to be where I used to live. You know, there's wide open spaces there in Montana. So to get from one, to get from your house to the grocery store is like 30 miles, you know, maybe or more, you know, depending on where, where you are in Montana. So they didn't have any speed limits out there for a long time. You know, just at, at night they did. You know, you had to drive 55 miles an hour or something at night. But during the day, you could drive as fast as you felt uh, was safe. And so then the federales back in the, I don't know, one of the 80s or whatever, said, no, you got to have a speed limit. If you're going to take our federal transportation money, uh, you got to have a speed limit. So they, you know, they fought it. Montana fought. But the feds won. So they had to put a speed. So the speed limit out there is 70 miles an hour. But the good thing is speeding tickets are only $5. So if you. <laughs> so, so they, they, they're, they're, doing, they're doing good out there. So people still drive like maniacs out there. But, um, and, you know, the thing is sometimes, you know, they lose, you know, if you lose control, I mean, that, at that speed, if you're driving 100 miles an hour, 149 miles an hour, and you lose, lose control, that's it, my friend. You're, you're toast. Unless you have, like, the miracle of the century. One of my uh, students from Montana was driving 50 and got hit by somebody and his vehicle flipped twice pickup truck like a Nissan I don't know Titan I think is is the big one the Nissan has and he and his kids they walked out of it and the guy in the other vehicle uh, flipped is an older guy, uh, you know, like 70s or 80s or something like that. And he, I think he turned his vehicle over, but it landed on, on four wheels, but it was totally demolished. And they got him out, and he, he had to go to the hospital, but he was okay. He was banged up. Everybody was banged up and stuff. But usually at that speed, it's, it's bad. Anyway, so they designed the bank on the outer ring, the outer lane, for uh, high-speed travel, and they just run those vehicles, you know, for hours and hours and hours. That's how they do it. You know, they test a vehicle, a new design. You want to see how it stands up to many, many miles. Um, so you crank the steering wheel a few degrees, and you just, and that way, um, you don't really have to s steer. You know, if the banking is right, you just keep the wheel straight. But if if the if if you want to go faster. You have to crank it, you have to, you know, put a little more crank to it, which you can do. But then the, um, the innermost lane is for testing trucks. Now, those guys, uh, that innermost ring is uh, configured for 50 miles an hour, so it's a little bit different banking. And, again, if you, if you want to, uh, you know, go faster than that, you know, you're in a, you know, a truck driver and you want to go 70, you have a convoy, you know, out on the interstate, uh, then you, uh, you know, you're going to be above 50. But that's what they do. So that's their, you know, all the automakers over in Europe, well, I don't know if all of them, but many, many of the automakers in Europe use Nardo. I think it's a Fiat facility built by Fiat, maintained by Fiat stuff. So it's a, you know, cir uniform circular motion on the planet is, is an example of it. Uniform circular motion in space Satellites. We have many, many satellites that have um, circular orbits as close as we can, you know, inches away from being a perfect circle. Okay. Now, so what we're going to do is derive some equations uh, for uniform circular motion. Now, what that means um, is a, a circular path, perfect circle, and uniform speed, constant speed. All right, now it's not uniform direction because every second you're on the uniform circular path, uh, you're changing your direction, okay? Uh, but 
speed. Now, what we're going to do um, is um, take a circle. Now, go ahead and make a circle and put a dot over there at the 3 o'clock position. All right? And draw a radius vector, position vector, on minus labeled in R. That's the radius of the circle. And it's black. And then let's say that this circular motion, they're going counterclockwise. Okay, so the, the velocity vector was, would be up. At 3 o'clock position, the velocity vector straight up. Okay, so that's an easy one. All right. Now, I'm not specifying the speed, but you can label it, you know, with a V. You know, so some generic speed. I haven't given you the radius. It might be uh, a kilometer uh, radius, or it might be uh, two meters, or it might be something else. But whatever it is, circular, uniform uh, motion means we have a V. And the V is perpendicular. Make a note of this to the side. And you're going to need some space to to uh, make diagrams here because we're going to make another circle very, very similar to this, and then we're going to do some triangles. But um, V, the vector V here is perpendicular to the radius. Okay? The radius is perpendicular to the tangent line at that 3 o'clock position. So if you if you draw on a nice tangent line at that three o'clock position, so a straight line that only touches there, uh, the radius to that point will be perpendicular to that vertical tangent line. The velocity vector is what we call a tangent vector. Okay? And it's, it's along the tangent line in the sense uh, that gives us counterclockwise motion. Now, if we had something going, uh, clockwise, it'd be the other direction, but still along the tangent line. All right? So, let's draw another circle. Okay, so uh, put a dot, draw another circle, same size, and put your dot up there at 2 o'clock position. Okay, so that's 30, 30 degrees away. All right? And now, uh, Type in, so this is at an, another instant of time. Let's call it T2. And the first instance of time, instant of time, let's call it T1. All right. Nothing too bodacious about that. And, uh, you know, it's, the speed is still the same, V. The radius is still the same, R. Uh, it's, but it's a different vector. You know, the position vector is now tilted at 30, about like this, okay? And the velocity vector is tilted 30 degrees away from where it was. It's now 30 degrees past vertical, right? And you can see that up here. And I did all these very, very carefully. So you do your, your own sketches as carefully as you can. All right, so there's my two uh, instances of time. So this is like two snapshots at the Nardo ring, 30 degrees apart. And so, you know, 2 o'clock and 3 o'clock positions. All right? Now, and so we're on cruise control. The speeds are the same. Positions, not. All right? The distance from the center is the same. Uniform circular motion. Now, if you have an elliptical track, you know, or some kind of curvy track, you can't say that. But if it's a circular track, like Nardo, yes. Constant radius. All right, now. Let me simplify this up. Now, what we're going to do now is draw in some triangles. And the way that we're going to draw the triangles is we're going to copy T2 position vector. Okay, there it is. Over onto T1. And then we're going to move that triangle. All right, so there it is. It's a copy. And I'm going to move it down there. Now, I'm going to do the same thing up here with the velocity arrows. So here's my copy of uh, the first velocity arrow. And then over here is the copy of the second velocity arrow. So 
Right, so those are copies. Okay, so, so go ahead and park that over to the side somewhere. All right. And so we have two, two pairs of vectors. The black ones are the position vectors. And there's a 30 degree acute angle between them. All right. Tail to tail. And then the velocity vectors, they look different, but they're also 30 degrees apart. Acute angle. All right. And so let me clean up my diagram here. And I'll make my two triangles a little bit. Oh, did I say triangle? Yes. Go ahead and connect the base of the position vector triangle. Now, that's an isosceles triangle. Remember that? Isosceles, that means two sides the same. Yeah, because they're both radii. It's a circular path. So those two babies are the same. Now, we're kind of constructing this triangle at two instances of time. All right, now this distance, the dashed line in my diagram here, that's the approximate distance that this vehicle or this object has moved. Now you gotta write down approximate because the actual distance would be a little bit longer than that straight line because it actually moves on a circle. So th this is going to be, so if your distance on the circle is uh, 100 meters, then this dashed line might be about, you know, like 97.2 meters. Okay, so still pretty close, you know. And if I'd chosen a different pair of instants of time, a little closer together, that dashed line, you know, I might not have a 30 degree angle there, but the dashed line would be shorter and a lot closer to the actual distance. So just say approximate distance and we'll be good. Now let's do the same thing up here for the velocity triangle. And that's an isosceles triangle as well. So V and V. All right. So we're doing good. And hey, you guys, what do you call that stuff? The red dashed line, the base of that red velocity triangle. What would you call that? What physics term would you call that? Any guesses? Wild, crazy guess? What's your wild, crazy guess? Yeah, delta V. Ding! Yeah, so that's your delta V. And your approximate distance. Now, you know, I didn't put delta X in there because it's not on the X axis, and it's, it's along a curved path, and so that would be a little confusing. But approximate distance, that's... A, that's verbal, it's not a symbol, but it's, it's, you know, it's good enough for us. So what we've got here are two triangles and they're similar or they're proportional. So the angles are all the same. And we've got 30 degree for the sharp one. And then let's see, the angles of a triangle add up to 180. So let's see. 180 minus 30 is 150. Now, do you guys remember the base angles of an isosceles triangle? Do you remember what the property that they have? Do you, you know, the base angles are the same size because it's symmetric. The, the, the isosceles sides are the same size, so the, the angles left and right are the same size. So 150 split equally between the two uh, angles at the base, so we got 75 and 75. So your two triangles are 30, 75, 75 degree angles. Now they're not the same size, you can't even compare them in size. Because one is measured in meters, the position triangle, and one is measured in meters per second, the velocity triangle but you can use proportion, all right? Now, uh, so we're gonna use proportionality, we're gonna work on some proportions. And for this one now, we're gonna say that the distance there, now we're gonna use a delta. And we're gonna say that it's approximately V delta T. Now we're still using the word approximate, but now we're gonna give it a, a symbol. 
So yeah, V delta T, you know, whatever the V is and delta T, you know, because that's about the direction of, you know, so if, you, if you're going at speed V and you, you know, from point A to point B, V delta T, that's it's approximate your distance. All right, so I'm going to put that now down here. So that's approximately V delta T down there in the distance triangle, the dashed base of the distance isosceles triangle. And what we've got now is the proportion there up in the upper middle. All right, R over V and then equal to V delta T over delta V. Connor. What figures? I'll explain it to you. I'm happy to explain it to you. But let's make this note first. This key proportion locks in all our equations. Our equations for the acceleration and force are going to come right out of this baby. Now, here we go, uh, Connor. Here's how we get R over V. That's the ratio of isosceles side to isosceles side. The position isosceles side and the velocity triangle isosceles side. See that? The, in other words, the long side. Long side for position, long side for velocity. And then this one over here is the base, the dashed line. Okay, so the the dashed line of the, of the uh, position triangle is in the numerator over here. And the dashed line of the velocity triangle is in the denominator there. All right, now, proportional triangles says, yeah, you can, you know, whatever the proportion is for isosceles sides, it's going to be the same for the bases. All right, so there's an equal sign there. All right. Now, I want to pause here and ask you to look at that. We got this kind of bodacious proportion, bunch of symbols, and this is dynamics. This is not geometry. I mean, it's, it's geometry plus dynamics plus motion. Anybody see anything in there? That is catches your eye. Notice anything in there? Look at that equation. R over V equals V delta T over delta V. See anything? Look. Don't look at me. Look at the equation. What do you see? There's no mass. But so there's no mass in this. So that's it. You can't compare it to the impulse formula. Anybody else see anything? Or like something squeezed in there that you recognize? I mean, because it's kind of a complicated looking formula. What do you see? Acceleration. Acceleration? Who sees an acceleration? I don't see... What? What do you see? Delta T over delta V? That's not an acceleration. Delta T over delta V, that's not... What is that? No. No. It's the flip-flop. It's an upside-down acceleration. So good eyes, you guys. Delta, you see it there? Delta T over delta V. It's flip-flop. So if we invert that, we'll have a, you know, do some cross multiplication and stuff. You know, we could get delta V over delta T by itself. Uh, so we'll do a flip-flop. And we got a V on both sides. So if we cross multiply the V... To the bottom on the left, we'll have R over V squared. And then on the right, we'll have delta T over delta V. And then if we do a flip-flop, we'll have delta V over delta T. Here we go. Dun, 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 dun. So we got it. Good eyes. 
Are, uh, are you a freshman? Yes. The newbie freshman. Scores. Okay. And I know you're not a freshman. Yeah. You are? What? Oh, all you sophomores, juniors, and seniors who showed up by a bunch of freshmen. Anyways, there's our equation. A delta V over delta T equals V squared over R. All right, so go ahead. Just, just write it A equals V squared over R. That's good. And guess what that's called? That's called the centripetal acceleration. Spell it correctly. C-E-N-T-R-I-P-E-T-A-L. Centripetal. Do not say centrifugal. Because the direction of this is towards the center. And you're going to have some homework tonight about figuring out the direction. And it's going to be toward the center of the circle. Here's a kind of a visual summary. Centrifugal means fugue, fugal, fugitive, flee. It flees the center. It's, it's pointing away from the center. But this one's not. It's toward the center. That's what centripetal means. Okay, so the acceleration, A subscript C, is on uniform circular motion. And notice, you know, here's the position vector R, so that's good. And notice about this that um, the centripetal force, excuse me, the centripetal acceleration, it's perpendicular to the velocity. It's always toward the center if it's a uniform circular motion. Because it's perpendicular, go ahead and make a note of this, because the acceleration, it's per perfectly perpendicular, 90 degrees, with the velocity, it doesn't slow the velocity down. It doesn't speed the velocity up. All it does is change the direction. All right, so this one... It doesn't improve the speedometer rating. It does change the compass reading, you know, if you have a compass mounted in your car, you know. So if, you're, if you have a GPS in your vehicle and it reads out the direction that you're going, which I don't have one of those, but if you do, and you go into, you know, like a big parking lot uh, in, in the night where so nobody's parked there, and just... You know, hopefully the cops won't spot you and think you're a maniac. But if you go around in a nice big circle and just keep it at 10 miles an hour, you'll see your GPS constantly changing direction. You know, north and then northwest and then west and then, you know, as you go around the circle. Okay. Now, on the Nardo ring, that acceleration comes from the tires. So the F equals MA comes from the tires. And, the, and this, is, this is why we say that the size of the Nardo ring controls the, the speeds, okay? Uh, because, you know, you, you control the speed um, with, you know, the accelerator and the brakes, of course. And then the actual design of the track, um, so you've got to adjust V so that your tires give you enough grip to produce a certain amount of uh, meters per second of acceleration toward the center that keep you from flying off the track and crashing. All right, so that's what this formula is about. So here's a little review, okay? Because of proportional triangles, speed triangle being proportional to the position triangle, we have the centripetal acceleration formula and here's the centripetal force formula. It's just F equals MA. The centripetal force, F subscript C, is just M times V squared over R. So, and you can write it in different ways. And what we're going to do now is apply this and finish out the rest of chapter 3. Because uh, we're going to talk about centripetal acceleration... Um, in the theory of uh, universal gravitation. 
So we're going to take this. Now this is something that applies terrestrially on a Nardo, the Nardo ring, something that's going around in the parking lot in a perfect circle that doesn't have anything to do with celestial mechanics. Now, so the theory of universal gravitation, we're going to start that now. Uh, and this finishes up chapter three. Uh, you know, that's a separate issue compared to centripetal. You know, so centripetal force, centripetal acceleration applies to anything, even if it doesn't have a gravitational component. You know, it's not a gravitational effect. All right. So we're going to put those together, though, and, uh, and uh, use it to talk about satellites. So here's what Sir Isaac Newton, you know, the, the famous legend that nobody knows if it's true or not is that a, an apple fell from a, the apple tree and cocked him on his head and, and inspired him to develop the theory of universal gravitation. And his theory says there's only two physical factors, um, the mass of the object and the distance that, or the mass of the two objects um, and the distance that they are apart. That's the only thing. And he said, look, if, if we do this right, if we figure out our formula, set up our formula properly uh, so that you have more mass and, and therefore more force, so a bigger planet exerts a bigger pull, uh, but if you're farther away from the planet, you get less pull. You know, he thought that that would be physically reasonable. And if you read chapter 3, and I think it's, uh, it's chapter 3, part 8, and then following, uh, which is new for, ch for the third edition uh, of the textbook, uh, you'll have, a, there's a, a, a little discussion about what he was doing. Um, here's the formula. All right. This is a pretty famous formula. The gravitational force between two objects, number one and number two, is the quotient of, in the numerator, a capital G, that's a symbol for a uh, conversion constant, called Newton's gravitational constant, then the product of the two masses, M1 and M2. So like 20 kilograms times 13.5 kilograms. And then the distance between them is in the denominator, but you got to square it. So you don't have third power of R, you don't have 3.4 power of R, you don't have 1.709 power of 4. We have exactly the second power. And that is a well, very, very well verified formula. GM1, um, 2, 2 of R squared. And let me give you a vocabulary term. This is what, this is we, what call we call inverse, inverse R squared force. force. Go ahead and write, and write that down. An inverse, inverse R squared force. force. The reason, the reason we use that vocabulary term is the electromagnetic, electromagnetic interaction, interaction between the protons, protons, protons and electrons. A static, static link. That's an that's inverse, inverse R squared force. So it's it's different, different electrical. Electric. So there's two there's inverse, inverse R squared forces, forces that we know about, about, about in nature, about gravitation, gravitation and, and electromagnetism. electromagnetism. Now, now, um, um, next time we're going to talk, talk about, about satellites, satellites and, and we're going to use, use the concept of centripetal force. force. And figure, and figure out some cool things about, about circular, circular, circularly orbiting, orbiting satellites. satellites. Okay, so and you're so dismissed. You're dismissed. Uh, homework, homework six. six. I'll, I'll have it running by lunchtime by tomorrow, tomorrow or so. Uh, you're I'll dismissed. I'll see you, I'll next, see you week. next week. And hopefully we'll have exam scores to give you.